You're listening to Discovering Truth with Dan Duvall. Hey friends, Dan Duvall here to tell you about three things. Number one, danduvall.com. This is the home of the Discovering Truth with Dan Duvall podcast. You can connect. You can become a podcast patron, meaning you give us a few bucks and you get a few benefits. You can also support us with merch by buying cool stuff like t-shirts, and sandals, bags, bugs, and the like with really cool slogans and hip designs. Number two, you can check out overcomeraccelerated.com. This is our resource for supporting the healing journey. If you happen to be a survivor looking for more freedom and faster, this is the place you've been looking for. Overcomer Accelerated allows you to get live ministry demonstration with yours truly, a community of other survivors taking an accelerated healing journey, access to over 100 hours of coursework so that you are informed, educated, and understanding not only ministry processes, but deep things about the kingdom of God, spirituality, uh, keys that will unlock an accelerated journey with Jesus Christ to the end goal, which is healing and deliverance. And you can even get discounted coaching depending on how you sign up. Number three, bridemovement.com. This is the ministry site. And if you have not connected with us through the ministry, and you've just been listening to this podcast, I want to encourage you to check out the ministry as well, bridemovement.com. So much there, and I'm not going to take the time to explain it here. God bless. Those were your announcements. Well, friends, we're back on Discovering Truth with Dan Duvall, and I have a guest that I have never featured on this podcast before. In fact, we had an interesting meeting. It basically amounted to him sending me an email and me just being like, why not? Let's do this thing. So I am introducing you to John D. Girolamo. I think I got that right. You, you got it. Yeah. Thanks for having me on the show, Dan. John D. Girolamo, and he is the author of several books, but one that we're going to be focusing in on today called A Parent's Guide to Internet and Social Media Safety. Now, for those of you that follow this podcast, you know that we talk about a lot of things. We talk about dark things. We talk about secrets. I mean, everything from secret space program to government projects and satanic ritual abuse. We've had a lot of information go forth. But one thing that I think all of us that are parents can agree on is well, we want strategies and tools for keeping our children safe from an ever-increasingly unsafe world. And uh, for that reason, John is joining me today because he has some keys. And so we're going to be focusing on those keys. And, uh, you know, John, I guess we'll just open up this podcast, talk a little bit about, you know, your initial exposure to the uh, awareness of trafficking and the targeting of children specifically. Sure. So, uh, so I wrote a book about uh, about human trafficking called "It's Not About the Sex," and it featured four different people. It was uh, an interview with a survivor, a law enforcement officer, an advocate, and a brothel madam's tale of redemption, and it really gave four different perspectives of human trafficking. And uh, I wanted to broaden that topic because there are predators out there not just looking for human trafficking uh, situations to exploit somebody in that way, but there's other ways that they can be exploited. And so I put together this you know, very short booklet that uh, can be read in 20 minutes that's specifically for parents about kind of why the predators are doing what they're doing, where, how. And what do parents need to know and what can they do to to kind of keep their, their loved ones safe? So, um, yeah. So, again, I really appreciate being on the show to be able to talk to your audience. So, all right. Um, let's talk a little bit about 
uh, some of the unknown ways that children are being targeted now. I mean, I think, sure. you know, it, it, things have gone pretty far from the guy sitting in a van offering children uh, candy. It's like, why don't you just get in the van and, and eat a right. piece of candy and uh, I'm going to abduct you. It, it, not that that isn't happening somewhere, but what are you seeing and, and, and what have you mapped? Sure. So, so let me give you a little bit of a background. So the first question is, why are predators out there and what are they doing? And they're really looking for either one of three things. They either want explicit content, they want to extort someone for money, or they want to meet for some kind of physical encounter. Now, they're going to target boys and girls differently. For the boys, primarily they're after money. For females, they're looking for images or they want to meet at a motel or something like that. So where are the predators? They're going to go where the kids are. They're going to Snapchat, TikTok, uh, games like Roblox, Minecraft, etc. And they're, they're going to try to get into some kind of private chat room, messaging, something like that. They want to become that person's online internet friend. Now, what's different about this generation of kids and teens is that they look at an online friend as a real friend, as an equal to somebody that you might see every day. You know, today's teenager looks at having a thousand friends and followers as a goal. I see that as a problem. So you've got a little bit of a mindset where, where kids are just trusting of people online. So as an example, uh, one of the ways that uh, that a predator will specifically target a boy is they will they will just do you know random uh, profile setups, usually fake, and they will set themselves up as an attractive, say, you know, college girl, and they'll start sending friend requests, follower requests to a bunch of teenage boys. And you know, it's so easy to say, hey, somebody wants to be your friend. Click, boom all of a sudden you're connected. So they do that and they'll do that to potentially hundreds of people. And once that teenage boy sees, oh, this girl's really attractive. Sure, I want her in my profile. Well, the next thing you know, she is now sending him a, uh, a nude picture. And in that picture, it will be explicit. It's probably downloaded from a pornography site type of thing. So then she starts to pressure him to say, look, hey, I've shown you, now you show me. And so many times he will fall into that trap, be tricked, send something, and you know they think it's all fun and games until it isn't. Mm. And the next thing you know, he's immediately being extorted. I've talked to multiple police officers, and they said that that situation that I've described can happen in less than 24 hours. And I think most parents are would be shocked to, to hear that. Well, I mean, it makes sense, though. And I think that, um, you know, I, I have be, well, parents are, and I think our entire society is more distracted than ever. And there's so many pulls. It's very easy for parents to just say, oh, this is a relatively innocent game or, you know, something that I can tolerate. I'll just let my kids be entertained while I take care of this concern and this problem and this and that. And, you know, trust that it should be fine. There's not this necessarily like, wait a minute, warning sign, warning sign. This is probably where my kid are, is going to be targeted. Yeah, the game itself might be age appropriate. The problem is, is that most of these games advertise, hey, play with people from around the world. Mm -hmm. Well, the problem is, is that, you know, a certain percentage of those are, are going to be predators and they're going to go to these kids or teen games and apps. And then they're going to want to get into a, you know, a chat room or something. I've seen cases where a, um, you know, a 10 year old gave out her phone number, her personal phone number. So now this person has knows exactly how to contact them, even when they're not within the game. And so the parent thinks that 
you know, they're sitting at the kitchen table making dinner and the kid is there and they think the kid is safe, but yet they're on their phone. And as one officer told me, the predator is in their pocket because that that's where the phone is. So let's talk a little bit about um, God being taken out of schools and the connection to the increase in pornographic usage. Yeah, so you know, I, I look at it a kind of a in a in a simple way is that when you take God out of families, the public square, schools, something else is going to fill that space. And that something else isn't going to be good. And when you've got a secular society that promotes essentially your own truth, you can find your own truth. There's not one truth. You know, right and wrong is is blurred. And and then, you know, they're encouraged at a young age to explore their sexuality, you know, kind of explore experimentation, things like that. And, you know, you've got uh, the situation with pornography is unique for this generation. It's it's no longer, you know, the hidden playboy that somebody might discover or something like that. Or y you've got to go to, you know, the 7-Eleven and it's in a brown paper uh, wrapper. You know, studies today are are finding a couple of, you know, very disturbing things. One, that the average age that somebody first stumbles upon pornography is about 10 years old. So that's not even puberty, adolescence. Their brain has not formed and, and it's highly, can be highly addictive. And you've got the trend in pornography to show very uh, depraved, violent, um, and, and and kind of really, uh, I would say, anti-women, you know, a treatment in these kind kinds of things. And so, so what does that do if your kid stumbles across that, or they're looking for that specifically? Well, um, it's going to give them a very different sense of what a relationship looks like, what a real relationship with intimacy, love, etc. And so, you, you're finding now that kids are are seeing these images and they're thinking that that's what's normal. That's how I'm supposed to act in a relationship. So this does two things. The first thing it does is it normalizes not only viewing content like that, but creating it. So when, you, you know, somebody asks for a picture of another student in a teen sexting situation, well, if it's normalized, it doesn't seem odd that they're asking, and it doesn't seem odd if, if you're the person who's wanting to collect content. You know, I was talking to a police officer who said that several senior teenage boys went to all the freshman girls and asked for their picture. And wow. they didn't really see anything odd or strange about that. And neither did the teenage girls, uh, because you've got this normalization of society. You know, I was reading an article from Defend Young Minds, which is an organization that essentially gives tools to talk to parents, for parents to talk to their kids about pornography. And and the author was saying that uh, their 12-year-old girl came home and said, you know, she was all excited. She had her first kiss with a, with a, with a quote, boyfriend. And then the first kiss turned into him choking her. And she asked, why did he do that? And the girl answered, because he saw that in a pornographic video and he thought that's what girls wanted. And Gosh. yeah, th uh, how incredibly sad, but that's, you know, they're thinking, so they're already viewing relationships in such a warped way, which is the opposite, of course, from a, say, a, a, you know, a biblical view of one man, one woman in a, you know, a uh, marriage relationship, you know, committed to each other, et cetera, et cetera. You know, not trying to date to find who might be a good mate, but for much opposite reasons. And so you're seeing that what I would call a logical flow of when you have that breakdown at the beginning and and, and kids are, are, are getting into this stuff at an early age, it normalizes this bad behavior. So it's really no surprise when we see the outcome. You know, uh, it's such a it's such a landslide problem because 
I mean, I, okay. So I remember, right. And I'm, I'm still, con- I would consider myself relatively young in my late thirties. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely younger than me. <laughs> <laughs> you know, w- w- when I was in high school, I didn't even have a digital image of me online. Like that wasn't a thing. It was so hard to even put a picture on a computer because you had to find a scanner. Like you had to get uh, a a, a local pharmacy to produce a file with a picture, which was like a special process. And I mean, it was like, it, it wasn't exactly the easiest thing for the average teenager to do that. And then where do you share it? You know, it's like AOL online, like <laughs> chat room, you know? And right. and so the, I don't think I had actual pictures of me on the internet until I was already in college and Facebook came out. And then it was, you know, uh, phones. I, I didn't get my first cell phone until I was like 19 years old. I mean, it was like all these hurdles. And now it's like, oh, well, every, every, 10 year old has a cell phone that can take video and picture and upload instantly to any number of things. So it's a completely different world. Right. Yeah. Um, and, and, and so we understand that, but then you see this targeting of the young people with this hypersexual agenda where it's like, not only is there access to illicit material that is absolute and, and, and pornography is trauma on the brain. It is literally a brain trauma which is part of the reason why it puts people in addictive cycles because the brain gets traumatized around images and all that. And then it, and then it's feed me more. The, and right. it's, it, it's beyond just decision-making. It's actually like a physiological biochemical. There's so much stuff that goes into this addiction pattern, but then you have these young minds and, and it's not just that they might stumble on these things. It's, Oh, I'm going to have to go to school and figure out whether I feel like a boy or girl today. And, oh, you know, then all of this is being normalized, you know, um, how does it not produce an environment right for people to just play into the hands of predators? It, because kids are being predisposed earlier and earlier to search that exploration of sexuality out. It's yep. just being encouraged. So it's like, a, I mean, it's quite a cocktail. And then... <laughs> the confrontation of that environment with biblical foundation, uh, foundational approaches to relationship seems so archaic. It's like, no, 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 no. Sex belongs in marriage. It's like for younger generations, it's like that feels weird because I've had so much hypersexualization of yeah. my mind and experience, and I'm talking about it and I'm you know, in, in one of these woke schools. So that started in second grade, like. Yeah. I, I mean, you've got a, um, a culture that's, that's pushing more of a, of a hookup type of situation. You know, marriage is not um, valued anymore. The traditional nuclear family is made fun of by secular society, celebrities, etc. And so it's, it's no surprise. Right. And when, you're confused and you need affirmation, that predator is there to tell you, don't listen to your parents, don't listen to your friends, you know, only I love you, only I, I'll take care of you, only I understand you. You know, they're master manipulators and they're going to feed whatever, whatever you need as a teen or a child, they're going to feed that to try to gain trust, to try to ultimately manipulate that person and um and 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 like i said earlier kids view these online relationships as real relationships even though they may not have really ever met that person they don't know anything about them but they're but they're trusting that and so you know things like covid19 the pandemic well what did that do i was just about to ask you about that yeah it it caused more time online Mm. And, uh, and, and so, you know, the predators were celebrating that. Wow. Okay. So for the parent that says, look, I talked to my kid, don't put pictures of yourself online, especially nude pictures or anything. Don't respond. So how yep. concerned do parents really need to be on this subject for a, a child that they feel they've educated? Yeah, the, don't be fooled is my is my is my quick answer as a parent. 
Uh, the stats out there are that 90% of, of high schoolers by the time they've graduated have seen, sent, received some kind of new f- picture, uh, many times from a classmate. And so, uh, you know, wait, I think wait, that you said you said 90 percent have seen some kind of explicit image wow. on their phone sent by by somebody. And um, and so, you know, I, I, I asked I went to a seventh grader and I said, um, is this really true? It, or is parents just making, you know a big deal out of a, out of nothing. Does this really happen in your middle school, seventh grade, 13 years old? And he told me, yeah, it, it happens. It doesn't happen every day, but it's already happened at the middle school. I've talked to school board members. They tell me the same thing. They have problems in the middle school and it's worse in high school. And so parents need to really, you know, be aware and even though they've had that conversation with their kids, that uh, that doesn't guarantee that you know a week later they're going to get um, lured in or tricked or something like that. So, what are your tips for how parents protect their children? Yeah, um, the the first the first thing is to really have that conversation with your child. And have it often. You can't have it at 12 years old when you hand them a cell phone and think everything's great after that. So having those awkward conversations for sure, uh, I recommend that the parent check their kid's phone on a weekly basis and check it uh, in all the apps, all the chat rooms, all the activity you know, uh, I've had parents say, yeah, my kid uses Snapchat. And I looked at their Snapchat story. And it looked fine until they found that Snapchat has secret folders, my eyes only, things like that. And they're horrified to learn about those kinds of things. There are applications out there specifically to trick parents and to hide apps. So I always tell parents that they need to install a, 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 a program something like asks to buy, something like that, where they can control anything downloaded onto that phone. And then I tell parents, go onto YouTube and type in, what do I do if I have strict parents? And they will be horrified at the thousands of YouTube videos created by teens, for teens, specifically on how, how to hide stuff anywhere from you know how to hide marijuana, um, in their room to you know hide their online activity, et cetera, et cetera. All they have to do is go on YouTube. You know, when I was a kid, if you wanted to be sneaky, you had to be creative or or ask a friend. Now you just ask Siri, YouTube, Alexa, Google, whatever. And so most parents have no idea about that. You know, there are parental control software programs out there, uh, like Canopy, Bark, several others. And uh, I, I would definitely recommend that. And then the other quick one is, especially for a young kid, get a dumb phone. You know, the, it's not a smartphone, one where there, you, you can't send pictures, you can't do video, there's no internet access. It's a very controlled who you can communicate. So when your 10 year old gets out of soccer practice, okay, they can text you and say, I'm done, but they're not having exposure to all this other stuff. Now, on the surface, that sounds like a great idea, except that culturally, that child now is susceptible to bullying over their lack of technological access. How do you encourage parents to deal with the side of, mom, every single child has a real phone and you want me to carry this around? This is, this is a, this is bad parenting. I don't (laughs) like you anymore. I, so, so help me there. Help me there. Yeah, every kid will claim that you are ruining their social life, and uh, and they will never recover. <laughs> and it's very hard to convince them otherwise. Uh, at whether it's twelve or or fifteen or or whatever. Um, but I, I, you know, the, it's tough. You know, my kids were um, growing up just as smartphones were entering the marketplace, so. Um, 
it was kind of a new thing and, and kids didn't have it until late high school and college. And so at, I didn't really have to deal with that personally too much. So I think, I think you've got to have a balance. You've got to have a, a conversation with the kid and really limit what applications they're able to, to go on. And, and again, check with their stuff. Okay. All your friends are on Instagram. Okay, fine. But we're going to look at that, you know, right after dinner and we're going to see what's going on because even if your kid um, is say doing all the right things, that doesn't mean that they're not going to get some kind of explicit image sent to them. You know, there's plenty of cases out there where somebody sends a group chat and sends an explicit picture to 20, 20 of their classmates because they're now, because they broke up with their girlfriend or whatever. So your kid might not be looking for trouble, but now all of a sudden they've got, you know, a seventh grader's picture on their phone. Well, and, and now you've seen it because you've checked their phone. You know, this causes all kinds of, of, of problems. So it, it, it really is, it goes back to, you've got to have that close relationship and it's tough because, you know, many times kids don't, they won't tell the parents what's going on in their lives. So you, you, you've got to really be diligent and kind of explain what's going on. But you can ask questions like, well, what would you do if you got a picture like this? What would you do if some stranger said, hey, I want to be your friend and, you know, let's go chat in a private chat room, et cetera. So I think parents can do things like that. Now, I want to ask you another question. Um, because I know that this is going to affect a lot of people that are in mixed family situations um, where, oh, because this is so common anymore, right? It's like, yeah, you know, you had two people that come and fell in love and everything was perfect until it wasn't. And three years later, you know, going in separate directions. So now you have two moms and two dads. Boom. Yep. All right. So now you have children caught between two worlds where, well, you know, my mom and my stepdad they let me do this, but my dad and my stepmom, they don't let me do that. And I am shared in my, you know, parenting experience because I go back and forth. Well, right. in that situation, there may not be agreement between two sets of parents as to what their children can and cannot get away with. And for the ones that are typically more like, I want our children to be that godly uh, uh, childhood experience and, and, and there's a conflict conflict over, well, but this is how we're going to achieve that godly experience. We're going to put some reins on technology access and how we're going to let you engage with your friend group. Um, and, and then there's freedoms in the other place that are not as, you know. So so for the parents that are saying, okay, I want my children to have that godly experience, but it's a mixed family situation and there are challenges there. We don't agree. Yep. What do we do there? What are some yeah, of your that, tips? Yeah, that, 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 unfortunately that happens uh, often where you, and, and that can happen even with, not in a, you know, divorce type of situation. The, the parents can have different, different perspectives. And, um, yeah, I don't have a lot of good answers on that one because mm. you lose mm. control when the kid is with the other parent and the other parent is letting them do things. It's, um, you know, I, I think it's coming back to explaining those biblical values and why they're so important. And, you know, ultimately, you you, you have to pray that your child understands that you're trying to help them make small mistakes, not big mistakes. And er everybody's going to make some kind of mistake, but you don't want it to be, you know, large and pictures on the internet, they're going to last forever. You know, Snapchat, you know, it, it disappears in a couple of seconds. And, um, you know, that's, uh, that just doesn't happen. And there's, there's, you know, screen re recordings, things like that. So, Things live on in the internet and it's really, really hard to get to get off of it. A little bit of a, you know, scared straight type of talk, I think, can help. But you do have to balance that to say, look, I, you know, I love you. I'm I'm trying to protect you. I know you think you know everything because you're 17, you know, and, uh, and 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 mom or dad is is not as smart as you as you think. But um, but showing them examples and finding out 
what's happening with their friends and who are their friends. Do they have the same values? You know, the old saying, you become what your friends are. And, uh, and, and that's really true. And so I think it's, it's trying to have that open dialogue to, to kind of stop some things before it gets out of control and, uh, you know, nip it, nip it in the bud, so to speak. You know, this is a bit of a, a, a side sidetrack, but this is one of my personal convictions that I absolutely stand by. And I think that on this subject, this is where we really get into the whole conversation on why why building strong marriages is so important um because the the biggest target of a broken marriage is the next generation that's the thing where right? you break the marriage and then the next generation gets gets the hit and yep. and this is this is really why you know you have several things that are very important for people to consider especially as they're picking their marriage partner like for women you know is the man that i'm picking to be my husband, the kind of spiritual covering that I want my children to sit under? Like, does he yep. pray for me? Does he pray to God at all? Does he believe in Jesus? Like, are right. there things about his character that can be trusted? Because that is going to be an impartation to the children when they come. And that's what's going to sit behind me, you know, the husbands like do you, do you trust the woman to be the mother of those children like that okay so then we get past that and then it's like you know um are we on the same page and can we fight for that because truly um the biggest gift i believe that every parent and can give their children is a strong marriage i really believe that too and it's like you know when children see the instability in a marriage that opens the gate for all kinds of things hurt and pain that drive negative behaviors and even drive them into the hands of poor friend choices and predators. And so, uh, you know, you could see God's heart in building strong families for that reason. It's like, that is the deliverance of the next generation. And we are seeing now in 2024, the fruit of the targeting of relationships, male, female interactions, uh, gender identity and the kind of fruit that's producing, which is not good fruit. I mean, this is, I think, ultimately yeah. the whole LGBTQIA plus uh, is is driving things towards absolute pedophilia and the stamp of approval on that. I, th I think that's the bitter end of gender confusion and sexual exploration in children and the targeting of kids with woke culture in elementary school. It is that that's the, the pedophiles are sitting on like just licking their chops and it's disgusting. But all right, now that I've said my piece on some of these things, I want to come back to you because I want to ask this question. Um, there, you, you interviewed a police officer who set up a profile as a 13 year old boy. Tell us about that story. Yeah, so um, so this officer was the the school resource officer outside of uh, Boise, Idaho. So kind of middle America, not uh, you know, not downtown LA type of thing. And so um, so he set up this profile as as a thirteen year old girl um, as part of a sting operation, and he immediately started getting friend requests from complete strangers, and within 24 hours was asked for um, to send pictures and asked to go out on dinner dates, things like that. Now this officer is sitting behind his computer typing in, well, well, how do I go on a date? It's winter. I can't ride my bike in the snow to, you know, to do these kinds. So very obvious this person is 13. And, and so, but, but the person on the other side, the predator was diligent. They said, well, Let's just meet at a motel. We'll do a makeover and I could give you a massage and blah, blah, blah. And so, you know, fast forward, the person was very explicit in their communication of what they wanted to do. And, and so Officer uh, Gomez uh, promptly arrested this guy at the motel room, him in the team. And they found his laptop and this person had sent hundreds of requests to middle schoolers, 90% of all the requests he sent were accepted without question, immediately click yes, sure, no problem. I'll just build how many people I have in my social network. Unfortunately, some of those people um, did send pictures. 
um, and also uh, two had met with this guy at a motel previously. Now, this was a, a, an even more interesting case because this guy was arrested on a Friday night and the guy missed his dinner plans. Now, why do I mention that? Because it was for his rehearsal dinner because he was getting married the very next day. Now, I might be an author, but I can't make this up. This is, <laughs> I'm not that creative. So this guy was marrying a lady who had a child by previous marriage. Guess how old his fiance's daughter was? 13 years old. Oh. You know, I, I, I can't make this stuff up. And so they did this sting one summer and they arrested 13 people in just a few months of, of the summer. And unfortunately, that story is, is pretty common where they're not arresting this guy on his very first time. They're arresting him when, you know, he's been doing it for for a while, un unfortunately. And so every parent needs to know that you know, their kid can be easily fooled. And, you know, I, I've I've seen interviews with with FBI agent, things, things like that, that have said that these kids will just be like, oh, OK, you want a picture? Sure. No problem. And many times they'll start out very innocently. Uh, Officer Gomez told me, I'll give you $10 for a picture of your feet. Okay, sure, that sounds innocent enough. I can go, you know, get an Amazon gift card or whatever. Well, that course, what they want for $20 is more than their feet, 50 and 100, et cetera. So they're grooming them for trusting and, and, for, um, and for receiving money for sending pictures. And that's one of the tactics a predator will use. Now, when children are being confronted and it's like, well, this is what's happened. We want to protect you from this. So don't do these things. Yeah. You said 90% of students by the time they're in high school have engaged in some level of this activity, received a sext or sent one or whatever. So then the question in the in the mind of the child becomes everybody does it and i'm not right. going to meet anybody when i'm 25 years old that hasn't done this whether it's a boss or a manager or the dean of my college everybody right. does it how, how how does that mindset get confronted in in your perspective yeah i, I mean it, you know it, it's the old just because everyone's doing it doesn't make it right mm. and it's mm. You know, it's going back to that foundation of what are your biblical values, what are your family values, um, et cetera. And, uh, you know, many times kids will get trapped into that. And as a parent, you, 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 you don't want to panic. You don't want to, you know, blow up uh, because then they'll, the kid will never talk to you about anything. So you, you, you almost have to really talk to them. You know, there are resources out there from uh, different nonprofits, Thorn National Center on Missing and Exploited Children. Will they give parents some tools, you know, what to do if there's a picture out there, what they can do, you know, never pay extortion. Um, you, you can go to, especially um, if someone has been sending, a let's say, your child's picture around, there can be legal consequences, things like that. Um, you know, the police are not looking to arrest somebody who's, you know, whatever sent, sent, sent one picture and it's, it's on one other person's phone. It becomes a bigger legal issue when someone starts sending it to 20 other people in a chat room, they sell it somewhere, post it on a, a pornography site, things like that. That's when you get into the legal ramifications. Um, but, um, you know, it's you have to fight the good fight because there's so many people who have God has fallen out of their lives. That's the majority of people these days that. Um, and so it's 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 almost like, you know what, we've got to circle the wagons a little bit and just because everyone's doing it. Um, that's probably, you know, a, a good example of of where the sheep are led astray. Yeah. <laughs> And I think, you know, on, on that one, I think that um, it it also comes down to it, 
for the parents, like, what is our commitment to demonstrating to our children why God's way matters? And how bought in are we to the ways of God? You know, I think hypocrisy is one of the hardest things that children struggle through is, well, you're asking this of me, but then look at what you're doing. And they see it. They do see yeah. hypocrisy in parents. And that is one of the biggest, I think, de destabilizations on enforcing a righteous cause. It's like, well, this is what we stand for. But if you can see the consistency in my conviction and execution of life, then that is something that builds, I think, trust and foundation for the children to respect what their parents are bringing to the table. Um, and that that's just my, you know, word for parents. It's like, like, you know, I think we have to be people as parents, if we want to keep our kids safe, that, 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 that live by our convictions and don't just talk about them or impose yeah. them and maintain a different standard. And so, so, uh, wow. Okay. So, um, do you think social media is safe at all? Uh, no, <laughs> I, I could tell you in another half hour about lots of examples of, of those problems, but, but essentially the answer is no, mm -hmm. because you don't know who the other, most of those other people on, uh, on the other end of that, you know, internet line, you don't know who they are, w what they're after. So it's, it's really not safe um, at all. And there's, you know, unfortunately, there's so many games, apps that are coming out. And many of them uh, are where are where the predators are hanging out. Many of them are, I, I would call, risque and provocative is probably how they advertise it. But, um, you know, and, and, and they've got these simulated things of, of oh, romance apps and erotica apps and, and, and all those kinds of things. And they're, you cannot keep track of them because technology is, is, is changing so fast. You know, kids today are probably two or three steps on a technological basis ahead of their parents. And so, you know, keeping control with uh, parental software is going to help having those conversations, as you say, kind of trying to live the best life that you can and and have that in, in your family, the strength of families. Because, you know, when the when the family goes one direction, the culture will follow. And then it becomes a vicious circle when, when the culture says, yeah, family's no big deal. Single parent, you know, not a problem. Abortion, not a problem. All these other things. And so the culture then sort of perpetuates that and, and it's bombarding today's family. Um, so I think that, you know, trying, trying to have a balanced approach is, is going to be the best way, but it, it, it is tough, but you have to accept that that it's not safe. Big tech is not looking out for you. It's not looking out for your family. They design products to be addictive. You can certainly restrict, you know, time on the, on the phone or on the laptop, something like that. That will definitely help. Um, but yeah, you, you've got to be the, you know, kind of the best role model and it's critical. We've got a, the perfect storm of technology making it easy for predators, busy parents losing, you know, God out of the, out of the public square, schools, families, et cetera. It's the perfect storm for uh, nefarious influences. And I think that's what we're seeing in real time. Do you have a set of signs that are consistent that parents can keep an eye out for like, okay, well, I've done my best to demonstrate. This is, we, we follow Jesus. Yeah. Um, and we are going to take a stand for biblical morale. And uh, yes, we're going to extend a degree of trust. Um, so, you know, here's an iPad. <clears throat> And, and, and we're going to explain to you, these, these are the rules, these are the expectations, whatever. But, 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 you know, folly is bound up in the heart of the child, right? And so <laughs> the, there, there may be some signs that yeah. parents can watch out for, say, okay, I, this is by this sign or behavior or whatever, I know something is off. 
Um, yeah. Do you have a list of those, maybe a few like thoughts on like what parents can keep an eye out for to say, oh, big warning flag. My, my kid didn't say anything. Nothing has been revealed to me, but something is off. Yeah, for sure. And, 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 and some of these grooming signs lists or danger signs are, are in the book. If I, do, if I can do a quick plug there, but a couple of them to really be aware of is a second cell phone. Um, a new trend is a, a teenager will have a phone that their parent reviews, but a second cell phone, you don't need a phone plan because you can just get internet access just about anywhere, get a hotspot or whatever. They're now using a second cell phone to do whatever. So any kind of second cell phone, big warning sign. Predators after your kids, if they may be sending them gifts. So if you see unexplained Amazon packages, things like that, big red flag. If you see something on their phone that is kind of like secret apps or apps that make it look like it's something else, another red flag. The calculator app is a popular app, does real math. You could do your homework on it. But when you look that up in the app store, the second line says also keep secrets, photo vault, et cetera. So what might look like an innocent app, I'm doing my math, is now something else. Another big thing is a change of behavior, withdrawn behavior, defiant behavior, sometimes all in the same day. Yeah, that can mean lots of things, um, but it could mean that your kid is getting into trouble. Obviously, any you know, drugs, alcohol usage, always ask questions when there's stuff like that going on, um, for sure. And then any kind of secrecy about who they're chatting with, who they're texting, who they're you know having a, a you know private message board, they're on Discord, whatever, any kind of secret stuff like that definitely uh, start asking questions. Wow. Well, those are some very good tips. I, 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 I listen to you. I'm like, yeah, wow. That's, that's really solid, you know, and, and, and I have a unique interest in this as well. My, my son is two, my daughter is five months. And so yeah. I'm in this unique situation where it's like, I'm not in the fire zone yet. We're, <laughs> But it's coming. <laughs> it's coming. I know. And I'm just like, gosh, and I'm looking at the situation lay of the land. I'm like, this is like a mountain to try to govern and like shepherd my children through. It is intense. So, all right. With that said, you do have a book. People can download it. It's easy to read. It's just 53 pages. Uh, and it's called A Parent's Guide to Internet and Social Media Safety. And that is at www.itisnotabout.com. Yeah, it, it's not about the predator, um, the parent's guide for uh, social and internet safety. And because it's not about what the predator is doing, we really can't control what's going out there, going on out there. But you as a parent can uh, have an influence on the outcome. And it's also on Amazon. There's a Kindle version. Um, it's only six ninety five, so it's you know pretty good investment from from that perspective, and it's just a bunch of quick tips, bullet points, you know things to consider uh, that I think every parent needs to know to try to get something in their toolbox, and that's really what what I'm trying to do is give parents uh, something to work with, and they can do you know some of the some other research on their own for say, parental control software, things like that. Well, thank you for caring, John, and thank you for doing the research and um, putting it all together for people to digest easily. Um, <laughs> I've never written a 53-page book, and so hats off <laughs> to you for being able to condense a thought. <laughs> yeah, well, it, it's there's a lot of stuff that we talked about. Um, mm. You know, some of these, like, lists of, warning signs, bullet points that um, that there's you know more detail on. So so I think that um, it's something every parent should read and have a conversation with their kid. Ask them what's going on in school. You know, I, I just kind of to, to wrap it up, I was part of a survey that surveyed uh, ninth graders in a small town middle school. And it's, you know, a 
79 people, not, I would not call that a super scientific type of survey, but 39% of the freshman class said that they knew someone who had been pressured or extorted by somebody online for something. Wow. And, you know, it was kind of an open-ended question. So well, what does that really mean? Um, that's a huge number for ninth graders. And so, um, you know, for parents who think that um, it won't happen to their kid, that's, that's a really bad mindset. I guess I'll, I'll leave it at that. Well, thank you, John. And uh, thank you for being here to talk to us. Friends, this has been Discovering Truth with Dan Duvall. And until next time, God bless and Godspeed. You've been listening to Discovering Truth with Dan Duvall. Visit me at dandevall.com where you will discover merch, books, and the opportunity to engage in our private social network. Join the tribe by subscribing to our email list and supporting this podcast.